and there, there she is. Uh, so uh, Richard is from, if those of you who don't know Richard, he's from uh, Escarpment Labs out in Guelph. And uh, uh, many people have, uh, many people who are not Canadian have problems saying Guelph for some reason or other. I don't, I don't know why, but, uh, but uh, Richard's from uh, uh, a co-founder of Escarpment, uh, Escarpment Labs and does a great deal of uh, work on, on the yeast strains that they're producing out there, uh, as well as being probably, I guess, one of the go-to experts beyond Lars for Gleich, uh yeast. So uh, uh, anyhow, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Richard. Go ahead, it's all yours. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, thanks, David, for inviting me. Um, I, it, you know, it's been a while, honestly, seeing some of these faces in this meeting, I, re I realized like, Darn, I haven't seen GTA Brews in a little while. So it's really good to, uh, to reconnect. Um, what I had in mind for this session was, was more or less just a Q&A because uh, it sounded like there was interest in a lot of different um, topics. Um, I did sense a few different themes and uh, uh, David did send over some, uh, <laughs> a spreadsheet with, uh, with all the questions organized. So that was super helpful. So uh, we can certainly work our way through that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different questions. So I, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to go and just do like a presentation on, you know, biotransformation or bike or something. Cause like, I mean, there's a few different things there. Um, and then also to sort of provide a, an update as to, you know, what escarpment's up to, cause you know, you guys probably haven't really seen us, uh, you know, so much in person in the last, the last year and a half. So, uh, I think that's, that's, that's a lot of fun as well. Um, you know, rest assured we've stayed pretty busy. Um, Certainly, I, I guess it was about a year ago that we launched those those new homebrew pouches. Um, so you know, got a little bit of a facelift. Um, they look like the room behind me. I'm in the logger room right now. It's it's probably my favorite room in the building. Um, we completed you know some facility expansion. Uh, still got some left to complete as well. Um, but you know, we've been able to keep um, growing the company and and changing the company through through COVID, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, launched a bunch of products this year. Um, if you haven't had a chance to try out Hydra for uh, hazy APAs or Lactic Magic for sours, uh, it's, it's similar to like the Philly Sour. Um, those ones were a lot of fun. Um, and then we also launched our yeast lightning, our yeast nutrient in the homebrew format as well. Um, and it sounds like people are, are enjoying their experience with yeast lightning and um, we're working on making it even better and even cheaper as well. Uh, so that, that's uh, something to look up for in the future. Um, and then there's some more uh, yeasts and, and other products coming down the pipe as well. And, you know, some of the questions that you guys asked uh, kind of forces me to hint at some of those. So I think you guys asked some really good questions. Um, I see Shane just bought Hydra. That's awesome. Uh, we, we really enjoy that. You know, we kind of initially launched it as being a solution for low ABV hoppy beers. But, you know, after a few brewers sent us back their regular IPAs with it, I can say, like, it's awesome for that as well. Um, really, really nice. Um, like juicy kind of mango profile. And, and, you know, it seems to be a little bit easier to keep the astringency down in those heavily hopped beers versus like a standard yeast like Vermont or foggy. So uh, yeah, I, I don't need to keep, uh, keep pitching Hydra, just, you know, try it out. And, and there's some more fun stuff coming from us in the next few months as well. Um, I'm going to get into some of the written questions, but that being said, you know, once we've gone through those, um, if you have a burning question that you didn't get a chance to ask ahead of time, feel free to ask in the Zoom. And also if I'm talking about something and I'm not making any sense, or you just wanna know more, like feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'll be happy to, to, to answer the question. And you know, sometimes I need that. Uh, <laughs> so that's important. So first question um, uh, from, from Marcello. Um, which is a really good one. Why does Escarpment Labs not sell dry yeast? Um, definitely get to ask that question a fair bit. Dry yeast is, the way that it's made is, is pretty different from the way that liquid yeast is made. Um, liquid yeast uh, works really well, you know, as a small business. Like we've been able to basically start making liquid yeast like in small batches, like, you know, 10 liters of slurry at a time and scale that up to hundreds of liters at a time, um, fairly easily. You know, that's the advantage of liquid yeast is that 
it's really scalable. It's really just like, you know, you pick a size of a propagator and you, you make that much yeast. Um, so for what we do and having so many different types of yeast strains, it works really well with what, with, with our, with our process. Like there's a reason that liquid yeast companies tend to have more selection than dry yeast companies. And it's because dry yeast can only really be produced in really big batches. Um, so, you know, it used to be like six tons. Now, now the minimums have gone down, which is nice, but even so it's, you know, if you're making a batch of liquid yeast, you're, you're, you're committing to like two tons of yeast, which is a, a huge amount, right? That's, um, would be a significant chunk of the amount that, you know, we sell over the course of a year because the companies that make dry yeast are orders of magnitude bigger than us. Like these are, these are billion dollar companies in, in most cases. Um, that being said, you know, there are some opportunities we have, I have no opposition to dry yeast. Um, I think that you always have higher purity and freshness with liquid yeast. So it does have that advantage. And that's why it's more expensive. It, it is purer and fresher as long as you can get it fresh. You know, we're all in Ontario. You can get our stuff fresh all the time. You're very lucky, and that that's awesome. Um, that being said, dry yeast, you know, it, it is it is more economical. It also has a longer shelf life, so it's always nice to have dry yeast around. You know, in case of emergency, or if you just you know want to brew and the stores are closed, it's a really great option. So you know, for that reason, and recognizing that dry yeast has value, you know, it is something that we're looking into. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see a dry yeast product from us sometime next year. That'll be my answer. Thank you. <laughs> uh, does the Scartman have any plans to release more mixed culture blends? That was from Mark. Uh, yeah, for sure. We're going to do more. Um, we've been really happy with our Belgian sour blend. I don't know if you guys saw um, Indy Alehouse won a World Beer Cup World Beer Awards award um, this year, uh, gold medal for their for their lambic. So you know, you, uh, feel free to to uh, uh, split hairs about whether or not a beer pitched with with culture is a lambic. Uh, they used our Belgian sour blend and won a gold medal in the lambic category. So that that should speak to the quality of that product. And you know, we're pretty excited about that. That being said, you know that that's been our main mixed culture product for a while. Um, and I recognize that people might want to experiment with, with some other options. So uh, one thing we did as a, as a limited run last year was a Berliner Weiss blend for traditional Berliner Weisses, um, you know, not the, not the fruited stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and we'll do that again. Uh, I think that's a, that's a culture that works really well. We've um, been working kind of on a, on a 2.0 version of that that's um, a little bit more reliable. So um, you should see something from us, you know, in, in a mixed culture format for traditional Berliner vices. And um, there are some, we are looking at a, like a mixed culture Saison blend, you know, that has bacteria for some of those nice, like tart mixed fermentation Saisons as well. But I mean, if there's anything else you're looking for, then, you know, I'm all ears. Okay, cool. There's a question from Karsten about, uh, about uh, why don't we have an alt beer strain? Uh, you have a great Kolsch yeast. To be honest, they're, they're very similar. Um, I mean, that, that kind of scene, Cologne, Dusseldorf, um, it's kind of hard to get any information about the yeasts that anyone is using, but as far as I can tell, they're all pretty similar. So I would say that, um, I mean, and I'm sure some people might disagree, but, but I do find that like most, most cold sheets can make a pretty good alt beer and, and vice versa. And then I would happily use um, our regular cold strain to make, to make a, uh, to make an alt beer. Uh, I think it would work great. So I've got a bunch of questions from Eric. So thank you, Eric. Um, first question was about yeast nutrients. Uh, when and why should we use it? What's the difference between DAP and yeast lightning, as well as some of the other options on the market? Uh, what makes yeast lightning the best? Uh, so yeah, yeast nutrients, that's an interesting one in beer um, because theoretically it's not necessary, but um, with exception to maybe a little bit of zinc, but I'm kind of of the position when it comes to yeast nutrients that, that you know, it, it doesn't really hurt and it's kind of like an insurance policy against a bad fermentation. Um, in general, wort does provide what your yeast needs, but it does depend on the wort. It does depend on the yeast. Some yeasts have higher nutrient requirements. Uh, some worts you'll get more nutrients out of than others as well. So like a, 
European Pilsner malt is going to, because it's got less modification, it's going to have a lot less um, uh, fan, free ammonia nitrogen, free, sorry, free amino nitrogen in it versus a, um, like a North American two row that's just been bred to be full of nitrogen and enzyme and, and all that stuff. Um, so the, there's some differences there. Um, so like my position is it's nice to have nutrients just almost as an insurance policy. Um, that being said, there are different types of nutrients and different, you know, levels of quality. Um, yeast lightning was formulated recognizing that there really wasn't anything that was designed for beer yeasts. Most of the yeast nutrients that are on the market are intended for winemaking or distilling. So they tend to have a, a, a lot of DAP or amino acids in them that your yeast doesn't really need in your wort. Like what, what beer yeast needs in wort as a supplement is micronutrients. Uh, vitamins um, like thiamine and biotin are, are really important for ale yeasts, um, especially. And then also there's, there's some minerals that also help with the fermentation. So um, for example, yeast lightning, we, we, put, we put some extra magnesium into it that helps with um, the yeast tolerating alcohol. So it, it makes it a little bit healthier when, when it's repitched. Um, so that was kind of the reason for yeast lighting is really, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of examples of this on the market. You know, there were some products that were kind of, you know, repurposed from winemaking or distilling, but not a whole lot that was beer specific. That is, that is starting to change. Um, but you know, that was the intention there is, you know, let's do what we can to make sure that beer yeast are as healthy as possible in wort. Let's, let's not sell a nutrient that's full of DAP or any other like filler that's not really necessary in wort. And let, let's try to make sure that it's, that it's packed full of the good stuff that, that we know from our research experience that a lot of these beer yeasts need. Cool. <laughs> How does a home brewer get their hands on, uh, on EL Fuego hot sauce? So yeah, we just released a new batch of hot sauce. Um, unfortunately, that's not currently available to the public, although um, we are working on something there as well, because I know that there's um, a lot of people that don't even brew that seem to want this stuff. So um, we are working on an option for, for, you know, anyone to be able to access the hot sauce. But um, what I would suggest is, you know, if you've got a local homebrew shop, uh, I'm, they do have access to it. So, you know, I think if you're uh, if you, if you bribe the, you know, the guy at the local homebrew shop, then maybe they can make something happen. Uh, Cliff, you got your hand up. Uh, yeah, Richard, uh, sorry to, uh, break it from the hot sauce talk here. Um, <laughs> as, as you take a break, um, but on the, uh, the nutrients, any difference, like if we're making a starter versus actually brewing a batch of beer, um, like from your research angle, like, should we be doing it for both? I think it would be good to have it in both. Um, you know, yeah, like even the malt extracts, like there can be some inconsistency in them that, that can impact the health of a starter. So I think it's, it's kind of a good idea to, to all, you know, if, especially because the amount of nutrients that you're adding to like a liter or two is really minimal. I think it's worth adding them. Okay. Okay. And then you just scale it down, like from a five. Yeah. You know, just to, to like a whatever pinch. it is for a liter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm sold. Can I go downstairs and throw out my other nutrient? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, don't waste it. <laughs> <laughs> it. Takes me two years to go through one of those little jars, anyway. So I know. Yeah. We keep working on that product, so uh, you're going to see a, an, an even better uh, yeast lightning uh, in the next year as well. Um, okay, another one from Eric. We're, we're oh, sorry, Attila, you got your hand up. Yes. Hi. Sorry. Um, speaking of the new stuff, I was looking through the brew magazine and another yeast proprietor has a different new yeast that I can't get my hands on. I'm just wondering if you guys will do it or can do it. It's actually, I'm not sure if you heard of them. It's, it's the Omega stuff. It's the um, Bonanza and the Sundew. Basically, it's the, um, you don't have the uh, clove esters in it. So you get all banana and all strawberry. Would there be a chance you guys make it in or we have to wait for them to bring it up here? Yeah. Um, what I, what I will say is, is that is something that we're like, we're starting to experiment with those kinds of 
targeted modifications. Like, yeah, what they've done is they've they've gone into phenolic strains, like a like a hefeweizen strain, and they've um, basically taken that that phenol producing enzyme and made it made it inactive um, using CRISPR. Um, so using gene editing. Um, so you know there there are obviously some some ethical things to to keep in mind and regulatory things to keep in mind with that kind of um, technology. Um, and it is a little bit harder to get those kinds of products to market in Canada than it is in the U.S., which is why you see these market these products hitting the market in the U.S. first. Um, but it is something that we're we know we're certainly thinking about and and. Um, on the research side, at least, you know, experimenting with, we just, uh, slightly different topic, we just, we just published a paper on using CRISPR to make it easier to breed uh, brewing yeast because that's actually a really hard thing. A lot of them are sterile. Uh, they don't have, you know, sexual lives of, of, any, of any capacity. So uh, we had to use some gene editing to make it easier to make new hybrids. Um, so that, that's also a place where we might use some of those, those technologies. So, you know, <laughs> long answer short, uh, you you will see some interesting things like that from us, you know, in the future. Cool. Because um, I love the um, half A's, but I'm like, oh, this would be great without the without the um, clove. It's like I want some, but I mean, I just yeah. I can't and in a lot of cases, of you know, it all lines from somebody else. So I'm not sure if they'll ship it up here or not. Yeah, and and again, because the the regulatory situation in in Canada is a little bit trickier. You know, one thing we can also look at is you know we do a lot of yeast breeding still. You know, it's I think it's considered old school at this point, but there's still a lot of potential. And uh, in some of these strains, you can breed out that um, phenolic trait. So that, that'll be something we'll look at as well. Cool, can't wait. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Um, okay, second last Eric question. What would your ideal Hellas fermentation look like? Yeast strain, pitch rate, oxygen, temperature, schedule, nutrients. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna answer that rapid fire. I'm going to say beer garden. I'm going to say, I'm going to pitch it at, you know, one and a half um, million cells per, uh, per mil per degree Play-Doh. Go for high rate. Uh, I'm going to give it a lot of oxygen. Um, hard to quantify, but a lot. Um, I'm going to pitch it at 10 C. I'll probably let it get up to 12, but probably not higher. Um, I'm going to add nutrients as well. And I'm probably going to use a lot of German hops, like a lot of like lower alpha ones, they're gonna have some flavor, maybe, maybe some, you know, some higher alpha ones. So it's not super astringent, depends on the water. Um, and then, so that, that's my short answer. Uh, probably just keep it pretty old school and bite the book. Um, and I would, he also asked, you know, would this be considered traditional versus new trends? Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit old school. If you ask me about a Hellas, if you were to say an American light lager, I would have a completely different answer because I think, you know, those can be made with crispy at, you know, 20 C and in, in two days, three days. But uh, if you ask me about a Hellas, I, I'm probably going to, you know, stick to a, a by the book German approach. Um, and then the other question was, uh, what does your current favorite homebrew Saison recipe look like? Uh, yeast strain, barn owl, spelt, hops, question mark. Um, I mean, Saison's so cool because you can choose your own adventure. You can do so many different things with it. It can be bitter, it can be sour, it can be funky, it can be, you know, it can just be clean. There, there's so many different ways you can go with it. Um, my standard recipe, like almost regardless of yeast strain is, um, I really like Barnell malt. I really like their, just their, their paint, their uh, regular pale malt for Saison's as a base. And then, you know, whatever other, like, so that'll be like 70%. And then whatever other thing I have around that's interesting, you know, maybe it's some spelts, maybe it's some malted wheat, maybe it's some rye. Kind of just mix and match for the rest of the 30%. Um, I like Saison's on the bitter side, you know, probably 35, 40 IBU um, in general. I also like them on the lower alcohol side. So maybe target 4%, 5% final. And then, you know, strain is kind of choosing your own adventure. Uh, I have a house culture that I call Zippy that it's been used in a few commercial beers as well. Um, I've used it a couple of times with Son and Hill and there's going to be a beer coming out with Slake that uses that one as well. So that's a just really nice mixed culture. Um, but that being said, I really love a lot of our um, escarpment products as well. Like 
Uh, I think something I saw it in the chat. Someone said spooky saison. Uh, that's a really nice strain. I our old world is still is still really nice. Um, and another thing I really love doing is blending saison yeast with Brett. Um, Old World plus Mothership Brett is a really, really nice combo for Saisons. Um, really, really like that. And then, you know, if you want acidity, the Belgian Sour Blend works works really well as well in those kinds of beers. And um, the bacteria will, will pick up some hop resistance over time. So um, I don't know if that was a very, you know, precise answer, but Saison uh, can go anywhere. So I'm going to give a, a pretty broad answer. Are you going to go full Guelph bicarbonate on that or... I like hard water for saisons. Yeah, I will stand yeah. by that. Uh, our, our, our water is pretty much only good for making saisons <laughs> <laughs> without, without making any, any modifications. It's, it's really challenging. But yeah, having some of that um, hardness and minerality kind of show through in a beer that's, that's so dry, I think it actually really helps it. And, what, uh, and I guess the, the other part of Belgian saison is like the bottling, right? Are you still a hardcore adamant? Bottle conditioner. With they're saison. better when you bottle condition for sure. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have to, but they're better. In my better, opinion, better sounds like have to to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the one I'm drinking right now is forced carb, and it's lovely. But um, I didn't. I also didn't brew it. Um, uh, Phil, Phil on our homebrew team brewed that. But uh, I, I do think that they're better when you can kind of push the carbonation higher in a bottle. Um, I really like that, you know, on a keg, you, you can only go so high without it being impossible to pour. Yeah. I have 16 foot lines and even then three, three is pushing it. Yeah. Um, okay. Next question, uh, from Mark, uh, it was about, I never thought I'd be able to brew lagers. Then I learned the Weinstefan strain was super clean at ale temps. That was a game changer. Um, as far as I know, Escarbon doesn't sell this strain. Any reasons or plans to? Um, I think you'll find that our that our ISAR lager, like our flagship lager strain, will be um, suspiciously similar to to that other strain. So, so give that one a shot. Um, I would also try out our premium pills. If you want fast ferments with a lager strain, you don't even have to go hot with that one. It will crush at like twelve Celsius. Like it'll be done in five or six days. It's 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 a really really um, aggressive lager yeast. So I'd also check that one out. Is it, uh, I got a question, Richard, sure. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you've caught my attention with saying it'll crash, uh, like it'll go through it in, in five or six days at 12 C. So, um, not to ask where it's, where the origin is from, but what's it similar to? It's a, it's a check strain. Okay. Um, it's it's like i mean there's kind of two check strains it's mm. it's the it's the less fussy one to put it that way okay um and it seems to like the way that it's grown right you know different different yeasts when they're propagated in different ways might might perform differently as well nice i'll, I'll have to i'll have to look at that now that you because normally i do my loggers under pressure and they're done like five or six days under pressure but to hear that i could do like a traditional you know, at a traditional temperature, right? You know, mm -hmm. that, that, that intrigues me. So thanks. Yeah. Or, I mean, 12 C under pressure is, I mean, that's, that's the sweet spot. So yeah, true enough. You know. <laughs> <laughs> which, sorry, which yeast was that again? I didn't, I missed it. Uh, that was the premium pills. And then um, for the closest thing to the vines to fall, like the 3470, I would, I would use our ISAR logger. ISAR. Um, now you said it crashes out at uh, 12 degrees. I mean, you ferment it at 12 degrees and it finishes, you, you still have to bring up a diacetyl rest on that or just when it's finished fermenting is done. I mean, you can, but I mean, yeah, diacetyl rest, it's, you know, you don't, don't go too crazy with it. Um, I think a lot of people go too hot. Um, I would just raise it a couple degrees and then do the sniff tests, um, every few days and, you know, make sure that there's no diacetyl and then proceed with, with crashing it. Um, but you know, both of the strains I just talked about, they, they, they tend to be not really have problems with diacetyl. Like it'll, you know, it's a, because it's a cold ferment, it'll take longer, you know, that's, that's why it's more of a risk with loggers because it's just a slower ferment. So it takes longer to clean up, but, um, they tend to not have issues. So like, you know, it does depend on the strain, but there's no real need to, you know, raise the temp crazy high with those ones. 
Okay, so then you said just ferment at 12 and when it's done, it's done. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, I'll try that as well. Cool, thanks. Yeah, but of course, I mean, you can use pressure and that, that lets you go a little higher in the temperature without getting as much esters. So, you know, there's options. Okay, all right, cool, thanks. Um, so another question, we're getting into the fight questions. There's a few of them. Uh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, most releases are isolates from the original cultures. Um, is there any chance of a release that includes all of the bugs from an original culture? Uh, that's from Cliff. Uh, we did do that. Um, uh, that being said, that was close to a year ago now. So we did release the Hornendal Farm Kvike um, a little over a year ago, I think. Um, that did contain everything we could possibly grow from the original Hornendal Kvike farm culture, which is this crazy mix of, you know, honestly, an uncountable number of Saccharomyces cerevisiae strains. And then there's also some bacteria in there as well. There's some um, lactic acid bacteria that, that adds some, uh, some, some acidity and some flavor. So that was a really fun project. That was also a bit of a nightmare. Um, I think the reason that you don't see a lot of yeast companies doing the original Kvike cultures is because they're, they're too complicated for, for what most yeast companies do. Like our bread and butter is growing up one pure yeast and making a lot of it and then giving it to someone where quite kind of breaks the rules there where you have this like community of yeast. Um, and it's really hard to replicate that in a, in a yeast lab. So, you know, we did the Hornendal farm quite as, as an example, but we haven't, um, we haven't done any others yet. Although, you know, we're very open to it. I think that that is, um, something that we can do within the scope of the, the quite ring, uh, program. Um, because that's a lot of fun to do. It's a nice challenge for us as well, because again, it's like the last 150 years of microbiology has been, you know, all about culturing and growing up single celled, you know, single strains of, of yeast. But uh, the reality with Kvike is that these are mixed cultures that, that these people have kept alive for a long time. And us taking it into the lab and selecting yeast is maybe not the most um, natural approach. So, you know, I, I definitely do favor the idea of, you know, seeing and challenging ourselves if we can actually reproduce the, the original thing um, in a lab. So, you know, Hornendahl's, you know, a really famous one because it's because it's complex, but um, there's some other ones that I think would be would be pretty cool as well. Like even Voss, like that original culture is is three or four strains. I think that would be a cool one to to put out. Cool, cool. <laughs> we got another question from Cliff. Uh, he asks, uh, other than being local and providing higher cell counts, both great things, what else makes escarpment better than other yeast labs? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Very, very good question. I, I will be happy to answer that question. Um, what makes us different? Uh, the, I think the key thing that makes us different from other yeast labs, you know, besides the fact that we're in Canada, I think that's a nice advantage. Um, besides that is, is that we, we have prioritized education and knowledge um, as much as we can. Um, not, not to say that others aren't doing that, but I think that that's been a, a really strong priority for escarpment. You know, we wanna know as much as we possibly can about the yeasts that we sell. So we invest a lot in research. Uh, we invest a lot in understanding the yeasts and, you know, doing these big experiments and sharing what we learn to, you know, so that we know everything there is to know about the yeasts. Um, we do genome sequencing as well. So, you know, now we even know, you know, every, every you know, genetic detail of a lot of these strains. And we're starting to understand even more clearly how to work with them and how to uh, help people make better beer with them. And then the other side of it is that, you know, we also have prioritized just fermentation education as well. So, you know, hopefully some of y'all saw our webinars uh, last year and in our YouTube channel, there's like 40, 50 hours of knowledge on there. Um, and that's a priority for us. And we're going to, we're going to keep that moving forward as well. Um, because I think that that's one of the biggest pain points with, with yeast is that there's just not a lot of information out there, especially like best practices of, about how to, you know, not screw it up. So that's a focus for us is providing those resources and, and answering those questions and, you know, doing stuff like this. Eric says, what's something you learned from your research in the last year that blew your mind? 
Um, <laughs> one one thing that, um, that that we've we've uh, that we found was we went through this whole project um, at the start of the year, uh, trying to make it easier to count. Uh, our foggy London, which is which is a really popular strain because it's so so well used for um, hazy IPAs. Um, but one of the challenges with it is it makes these these kind of like it makes clumps or chains of cells. And so you know we tried a bunch of different ways to declump it or deflock it. But um, you know the 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 kind of mind blowing outcome that we came to was these cells are like actually physically stuck together. So. It's almost like foggy is, you know, in, at some point in its growth, like multicellular, like the cells are physically still attached to each other versus flocculation where it's like kind of like Velcro. This is like super glue. Um, so that was kind of a, a pretty crazy thing to, to see that, you know, the basic biology of the strain was defying our ability to, to declump it. Um, so that's a fun one. Might also explain why it, uh, you know, loves to, you know, float on top of the fermenter and stuff like that. But you know, there's lots of other things, lots of other things I can't talk about yet. Um, we also just, uh, we're in the process of publishing a, another uh, Kvike paper um, with the folks at, at University of Guelph that we work with. And, you know, one of the things that they found is that Kvike makes, uh, and I, you know, I can go off the rails on this, but Kvike makes a lot of uh, this stuff called triolose, which is this really cool molecule that helps organisms survive all sorts of stress. And, uh, like, you know, in some cases, the cells are like 15% triolose, which, which was also mind blowing and, and helps to explain why these things are so good at uh, drying and, and starting up fermentation and, you know, all the cool stuff that we like them for. What's a normal percentage of triolose in a, in a non kvac yeast? Like, like one? Five, or, five or six. Okay. Yeah. So three I times. believe, I believe Richard, you mentioned that during the brewlosophy, uh, the brew lab uh, podcast. Um, and I found that really intriguing, like, I mean, when you were talking about it and it was, uh, it's that type of research that that's kind of like, that you don't hear coming out of some of the, at least I don't right here coming out of the other yeast labs. Right. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of them are, are very sales oriented and I think it, it it's doing well for them currently, but I, I'm not sure, you know, our, our intention is to, is to build value long-term, you know, over the course of years. And, you know, other companies might, might be growing faster, but, you know, we want to make sure that long-term we're the place that people go for advice. So if, we, if we change my question to what did you learn two years ago, does that mean that's published and you can talk about it? <laughs> oh, I mean, well, the, the triolos thing was originally that long, but then research takes okay. so long to, you know, confirm and validate. Uh, it takes a while to share. <laughs> right. Two years ago, two years ago, we were just learning that different lactose strains had had flavors. <laughs> things that uh, things move fast. Um, I had another question about uh, from Justin. I don't I don't think I saw him here. Um, it was about lactic magic, um, which is our um, lactic acid producing yeast. Um, it's a, it's a species called Lachancia thermotolerans. Um, there's a couple other ones on the market, but the really cool thing about this yeast is that it, uh, in addition to being able to complete a fermentation, like a beer fermentation, it turns glucose into lactic acid. So if you have a wort with a lot of glucose in it, you can have it ferment out, turn, turn the glucose into lactic acid, and then ferment the wort sugars. And, you know, you get a sour beer without, without even using bacteria, which is, um, a pretty cool concept and it doesn't make like ripping sour beers, but it can make some really nice, um, tart flavors. So, you know, we thought it was worth making that strain available to people. Um, that being said, since it's, it's, you know, it's origin is as a wild yeast, like one of our staff, uh, wild captured it in his backyard here in Guelph. Um, it's not as predictable as a domesticated yeast. So, we're still learning the best ways to use it. So, you know, Justin's comment was he didn't get quite the acidity that he had hoped for. Um, and we're still, you know, one, one thing we're finding is that uh, some, some of the variables in the beer, like oxygenation and uh, water chemistry um, can impact the acidity. So we're still learning and collecting feedback. And what we're doing is updating our recommendations as time goes on. But, you know, my typical suggestion for people that, you know, want to have a nice sour beer with that strain, 
uh, the first time is uh, add add more dextrose than you think you need, uh, and you know follow our advice, and and you should be able to get something that um, you know has some nice acidity. I think a lot of people are afraid to you know dump in pounds of dextrose, but it's kind of what's needed for this yeast. Um, on the topic of alternative yeast, we also had a question from Luke. Um, any chance of a schizosaccharomyces or torolospora strain might show up in a future clike ring release? Well, we haven't found those in clike. We do have a few. I mean, these are alternative yeast, non-saccharomyces that do some cool things. Um, we have found a few. We did test um, some torolospora for non-alcoholic beers. Um, weren't super happy with, with any of those strains, but we are, we are working on a yeast for, for non-alcoholic beers. So that's something that's also in the pipeline as, as those become more popular. Um, schizosaccharomyces, that, that's a real weird one. Um, that's a really weird yeast in the sense that it doesn't even, um, bud like almost every other yeast that we use in beer does like, you know, they make a cell and then it buds off a little one. And then that separates, um, schizosaccharomyces, um, divides. So you have a cell and then it forms, you know, a uh, septum and then it kind of divides like that. So you get two equal sized ones, um, looks completely different um, because that behavior of how the cells divide is pretty ancient. It's also very distantly related from regular yeast. So those behave really differently too. There is, I know there's this guy that's been posting on Milk the Funk about schizosaccharomyces. I know he's been putting in a ton of work on, you know, making it work in beer. So um, keeping an eye on that basically. And if someone, someone makes, you know, a really, really good beer that has unique properties with one of those yeasts, then, um, you know, we'd be happy to take a look at that, you know, in terms of commercialization. We, we found that yeast in a couple of wild capture pro projects and we've, we've made beers with it and it will attenuate wort. But um, one thing we found is that there was often a lot of sulfur and it you know didn't really offer much advantages over like a Saison yeast or something like that. But we're keeping our eyes open with the, like the non-saccharomyces yeast. And there's a lot of potential there, especially when we get into non-alcoholic beers to um, get some really, really cool flavors. Cool, cool, cool. So it sounds like last month you guys uh, were talking with Scott Janish. So that's that's awesome. Um, I'm I'm a fan of his work. Uh, and Brian says last month he had us excited about modified yeast overexpressing uh, beta lyase. I'm wondering if uh, we might have any insights on if something like that may become available in Canada. Uh, so that's from Brian. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because uh, that that has become I think I think that's just generally a good idea is um, increasing the activity of those yeast beta lyase enzymes. Um, what those do is those help uh, release bound thiol precursors in the hops, which are, those are tropical aromas. So basically if a yeast does this thing better, it will release more tropical aromas from the hops. So you get more value out of your hops, right? The really cool thing is that there's a lot of cheaper hops like Cascade that are really high in bound thiol precursors. So with the right yeast, you know, the theory goes that you could make Cascade taste like, you know, more like mosaic or citra, um, which I think is really, you know, an exciting idea. Um, and then to that end, uh, we are working on something. Um, I spoke earlier about, you know, some of the challenges just with regulation in Canada. Um, and that's the thing that's holding that back. Like we, we actually do have a strain that is ready to go. Like I'm ready to prop it, send it to testers, um, get it onto the market. We're just waiting for some feedback from um, the regulatory powers that be as to whether or not we have to do that or whether we have to send them more paperwork. So um, that's actually really, really close. So keep an eye open on, you know, uh, what we're talking about because, um, well, it's either really close or it's another six months, right? It's one of those situations. Uh, I got a question from Luke. Uh, when I'm writing a recipe, I'm wondering how much the warts IBU content will be reduced by the yeast strain I'm using. Uh, I know Escarpment has done some trials on this. Any chance that data is headed for publishing uh, or was already published? I just missed it. Uh, yeah, we haven't actually published that. We talked about it in some webinars. 
Um, but it's 100% my fault that we haven't actually published that. I will, I will take the blame there. Uh, but that was one of the cool things that we found when we did a big comparison of 60 or 70 different yeast strains was that when you measure the IBUs at the end of the, at the, end of the fermentation, uh, some of them were a lot lower than others. Um, it seems that some of the yeasts actually reduce the IBUs in the beer and, you know, and some do it more than others. So the thing that we found is that a lot of the um, British strains are, are reducing IBUs um, a fair bit, like up to a third of what you started. So, you know, you might start with 30 IBUs, but the actual measurable amount at the end is 20. Um, but then there's some other yeast that don't touch it as much, like the Saison strains and the lagers um, tend to leave it pretty much intact. Um, so yeah, we haven't published that, but we are we are working on a project um, that uh, will also <laughs> be out in the next uh, the next six months or so. Uh, we're we're working on it. You know, it ended up being so much that even that specific project ended up being so much data that that like a paper doesn't really make sense. So it's going to look almost more like a like a book um, with a whole lot of information on the different yeasts. So look out for that. Um, so, and then the final question was, was also similar uh, to the, the other one about Kvike and uh, mixed versus single strains. So um, that's about it in terms of the written questions, but I'm, I'm almost certain that, that I'm, there's gonna be a few more from the crowd. So feel free to go ahead. Yeah, we did have like, uh, Richard, we did have one that was posted on the website that I didn't get onto the, uh, onto the spreadsheet uh, from Adam. And it was about uh, how do you develop and evaluate new yeast strains? Is it more of a science or an art? And the second part of it was, what are the measured characteristics, i.e. flocculation, attenuation? Like, oh. Yeah, it's a bit of a science and it is also a bit of a feeling. There is, you know, I think some intangibles there as well. So, you know, number one, if we are evaluating a new yeast, uh, maybe it's something that we bred or, or, modified, you know, that that's kind of the name of the game more recently, you know, we've uh, seen a lot of the traditional yeast now. So now we're getting creative with with making new things. Um, the first thing is always just comparing it, you know, just getting the numbers and comparing it to um, other strains. So that might be miniature ferments where we're looking at the fermentation rate, we'll look at the attenuation, we'll look at the flocculation, just all of those kinds of basic traits of the yeast. And then if we really like it based on that, like say it's fermenting fast, it's hitting a good attenuation or, you know, our target, um, you know, some of the, some of the aromas we're getting off and the mini ferments, you know, are good. It's not horrible. We'll, we'll move that up to a sensory trial. So that's really, that looks like home brewing. It usually is home brewing, um, <laughs> make a batch of beer. And, and usually there's, there's still some kind of comparison, some kind of, um, you know, anchor or baseline or control, but you know, we'll do, we'll do a homebrew experiment and, and get, get people here to taste the results. And, you know, we can collect some data on that. That's always really helpful. You know, do you like the beer or what does it taste like? Um, we, we used to do some more in-depth sensory, but that's been, that's been a lot harder with COVID. Um, so, you know, a lot of our sensory is very practical right now. It's, you know, do you like the beer or, or, you know, describe the flavors that you taste in this beer. Um, but then, you know, I kind of spoke on intangibles and one of the intangibles that I use for, you know, whether or not a strain is going to work is how fast does the beer disappear? Is it sitting around or is the keg gone? Um, you know, and that was, that was one of the, uh, a really good example for that was, was when we were testing out crispy, you know, made a, we made a logger of some descriptor with crispy, which is, which is our, our clean like, um, that, that can turn around lager like beers, um, at higher temperatures. So, you know, really great in the summer, um, put that on tap and just said, Hey guys, there's a, you know, there's a beer with crispy and beer garden, you know, on tap, try it out. And, you know, I came back a few days later and the keg was gone. And, you know, that was basically the decision there. It was like, okay, we, we got it. We did it. <laughs> um, so, you know, that that's really important too, because ultimately like what matters is, is the yeast going to make a beer that people, you know, want to taste and want to drink and taste good. Um, and, you know, we'll be doing, we do that testing in-house. We also, you know, get it out to breweries as well and, and get their feedback. And, 
you know, once again, you know, how fast does that beer move? Do people enjoy it? That's really the, the metric of success with, with the yeast. Nice. We had, we had a few questions coming in on the chat, right? And um, uh, I'll just go through them step by step. So Rob had actually asked, what did you last homebrew? What did I last homebrew? I last homebrewed a <laughs> surprise, surprise, a Saison. Uh, <laughs> I, I used our Saison Maison because I, I honestly hadn't used it in a while. That's our non diastatic Saison. So it is more popular on the pro brew side where, you know, some of those, especially the bigger breweries, they just don't want to risk using the diastatic yeasts anymore. Um, that's a yeast that has the Saison flavor profile, but it doesn't have the diastatic quality. So um, it doesn't dry out the beer as much, but it, but it still has that flavor. So I just brewed a, you know, a Saison using that. And then also some, um, amyloglucosidase enzyme. So, you know, you add that stuff and it basically dries out to nothing because it, um, breaks down all of the, all of the starches and dextrins. Um, so, you know, kind of just making like a safe Saison in that, in that case with, uh, the Saison Maison and, um, amyloglucosidase. And um, I'm just going to bottle that very soon. And I'll probably use it as a little trial for some Brett strains as well. Um, you know, I love, I love, I love making clean saisons because then you can, you know, put it into bottles and test out four or five different Brett strains just by, you know, putting a drop into a bottle. Um, so it's a nice way to do those experiments. Nice. Um, Guillaume had asked, why does English ale one clump together and feel really strange when I run my hands through it. <laughs> yeah, that yeast is almost like uh, putty. It's, uh, it's, well, it's one of the most flocculent yeasts that we have. Actually, it might be the most flocculent yeast that we have. So the cells are just kind of, you know, trained over time to, to clump together really well. And I kind of alluded to flocculation as like these cells having Velcro on the outside. Um, and that is, you know, kind of how it works, right? If, 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 two cells have these molecules on the outside, then they're more likely to stick to each other and adhere. And um, English one is one of the most extreme examples. Like basically it's got a lot of Velcro, so more cells clump together. Um, you know, it has more of these uh, cell surface proteins that um, allow the cells to adhere to each other and stick and make these gigantic um, clumps, which then, you know, when you zoom out to, to human scale, it means that you get a yeast slurry that you can actually like, mold in your hand if you want to. Um, I saw a picture where someone had actually shaved, uh, shaped like a couple uh, balls into like a little yeast snowball. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Um, Daryl had asked a question. Uh, have you thought about doing any wild capture projects for home brewers to capture similar, similar to what bootleg does? Oh, like the kits? Uh, I'm not sure if Daryl meant the kits or, or if he means like, because uh, I know bootleg biology does offer some of the, uh, yeah, now he's saying, yeah, the kits. Yeah, so the there kids. you go, the kits. <laughs> yeah, it's not something that we've, like, we haven't done that before. Um, it's something we can certainly look into if there's if there's interest. Like, even if there's a group of people, you know, five or six people that, that want kits, that that motivates us. Um, so, you know, if there's, if there's interest. I know, yeah, a long time ago, we actually did do a talk on wild capture. Um, and reading Rob's, Rob's comment. Um, and we did bring some, you know, little, little, basically little bottles of sterile, um, sterile media to, for people to try doing their own wild captures. So, um, it is, you know, it is relatively simple. We do have some presentations on wild capturing yeast. So that is where I would suggest starting. Um, but then, yeah, if you want to get into kind of the, you know, agar culturing, uh, side of things, then, you know, maybe there's some opportunity to, to, uh, put some kits together as well. Cool. Uh, I'm going to do one more question from the chat and then I'm going to give it to Bear because he's had his hand up. Uh, with this month's style focus being porters and stouts, which of your yeast strains do you recommend for these styles and what tips would you have on best utilizing your yeast in those styles? Yes, um, the English strains, I think in general, but it kind of depends on the, on the sub style, I guess. But um, I think English one, English two are, are just awesome choices. I think English two would probably be my choice for pretty much any porter or stout in the sense that it can also do the, like the American variants as well. Um, whereas English one might be a little, a little too um, 
it, it might not be dry enough for for all of the all of the American styles. Um, yeah, that's probably where I would go, just because I really like. Like it depends on your preference, but I really like some of the esters that those yeasts produce. And I think it balances really well with some of the darker malts that, um, you know, it, it can, depending on the beer and depending on the wort, like it can be a little astringent. And so like having a little bit of that fruitiness from the yeast, I think helps balance it. It's almost like you can sort of think of it the same way as coffee. Like if it's only roast, mm -hmm. then it's like not very nice when you have a little bit of fruitiness in there, it's a lot more balanced. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I think about porters and stouts. Maybe I just want them to be coffee. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> there is or that. vice versa. <laughs> it actually, that does open it up, though. I mean, because like, um, as I was talking about imperial stouts and that type of stuff, like, I kept thinking, oh, it's just going to be Chico all the way, like Cali, Cali Ale. For, for the high grab stuff, I would go, yeah, like a clean American strain is great. Um, you can also, like, Kvike is fits in really well there like we've done mm -hmm. we've done you know 16 percent beers with horn and all and it's it's happy the whole way through um nice. so you know the, yeah with the higher gravity stuff you get some some interesting options okay uh bear you had your hand up so go ahead yeah i did um i don't know if everybody knows but uh uh and if you don't it's worth mentioning again the club makes a donation to a charity for every presenter that comes on board um and we've asked richard to pick a charity and he picked a certain charity maybe i'd like to hear why you picked this charity and what the charity is and maybe talk a little bit about it sure yeah i picked uh i picked each and every which is uh that that's a a group that was formed um actually by a uh uh, a similar business to ours out, out in, in Alberta, Raft Labs. Um, they don't make yeast, but they do like quality services for um, for breweries out there. So they're kind of, you know, acting as the, the QC center for um, breweries out, out in Alberta that don't have their own labs. And um, one thing that, that Ewan out there uh, has really been pushing for is, is helping to sort of create this organization, um, which is centered on um, providing resources and awareness about harm reduction um, uh, specifically, you know, uh, as a, as a craft beer working group. So they do, um, some, some collaboration brews. Um, they also provide resources to those members. Um, and, you know, specifically for us in Guelph, it's really important because, um, you know, you might think of Guelph as a super, you know, green and bougie city, but, um, it actually is, you know, it does have a lot of, um, uh, public health problems when it pertains to the op opioid crisis. You know, there's still uh, more people ending up in the hospital and, and dying in Guelph as a result of, of opioid overdoses than COVID. So it's, it's still very much um, top of mind. So I thought that would be, you know, worth, worth highlighting because, um, yeah, the need for harm reduction is, 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 is pretty clear um, here in Guelph. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Rob had a question says, I saw you have a food ferment section on your site with a sourdough starter. Are you exploring any other non-beer fermentations, any liquid yeah. yeast, wine, you know, wine, champagne yeast? That's a reason there's a section. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a, we're going to have a lot more options there. Um, the, the kind of macro scale thing that we see is that, you know, uh, a lot of the non-alcoholic fermented foods are, are growing at a rate that's faster than, than beer is. You know, we love beer. Beer is still number one for us, but it's, uh, it's stupid to ignore some of the other stuff like sourdough and kombucha. Um, so we're, we're looking to be offering some products, um, you know, for those applications as well. Um, wine is also something we're looking at. Uh, we're actually running a trial of a wine yeast um, this fall. That's, um, I, yeah, I can't give all the details. That's in partnership with, with a university um in ontario and you know just trying to make a liquid ontario origin wine yeast available to wineries so you know we're doing the trial this fall if that's all uh, if that all works out then then i'm hoping we can have something that's available to uh home brewers next fall cool um <laughs> Eric's asking what yeast you would recommend for his coffee. <laughs> so it's not a stupid question. Um, 
okay, someone asked me about, you know, mind blowing things in the last year. That's another one. A um, couple of our production guys got interested in, in coffee fermentation, um, specifically like coffee re-fermentation because um, coffee is often fermented, you know, at the farm. Um, but they did an experiment with soaking green, like unroasted coffee beans um, and fermenting it with, with different strains of yeast and lacto and uh, drying it back out and roasting it. And the results were crazy, like very, very different. I didn't expect to taste, you know, so much difference in the same coffee bean base that's fermented with kvike versus lacto, um, for example. And um, that was really eye-opening. So that's something that I think we'll actually explore a little bit more. So you actually can ferment coffee and get some really cool results. That's really fun. That's neat. I, I have I have one question. When when are we getting these back? I, w- I want these back. <laughs> if uh, I mean, if you pay us three fifty, uh, we'll sell you them. <laughs> Still have some. <laughs> Yeah, I, I saved almost every single one of mine. I've got like six or seven of them sitting around that I, I'm trying to figure out exactly what to do with it because they're small enough to hold certain things, but they're not big enough to hold other things. So, but, but they're, they're so handy. Yeah. I, I always thought, right. But I also understand the cost of something like this packaging yeast and something like, like this versus the, pa- the pouches, you know, yeah, the uh, bottles were presented many challenges. Yeah. Uh, although I have heard people have done cool stuff with them. Like I know, I know there's some people that, that use those for backpacking or traveling and stuff like that. So um, like camping. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, long story short. Yeah. They, they cost about three fifty dollars each. So uh, yeah. <laughs> happy, happy to sell them if someone wants to order a bunch. <laughs> yeah. Cost prohibitive. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of other questions now. Uh, Daryl's asked, I've been making hop water. One of the big producers adds yeast to it. I assume this is to is this for biotrans. Is it possible to get biotrans when there is no actual fermentation? I don't know. Yeah, I've also been curious about that and didn't really get a straight answer out of them. So I'm actually not sure. And then Luke asked, did any did any of them try growing koji on coffee beans? Of course we did. <laughs> of course we did. Yeah, we did try that. Uh, Bob asked the question: With all the new yeasts, have the clean in? I'm uh, sorry. Uh, with all of the new yeasts, have the clean in place process and chemicals changed much? Yeah, like <laughs> we with with all the new things that we've added, it has meant that that we we've introduced some complexity on the production side. So, like for example, when we started up, we had what we call three risk levels of yeast: you know, clean, phenolic diastatic or brett or bacteria one two three but then we started introducing some products that could actually be contaminated or compromised by the level ones so now we have a level zero Um, so that's for the (laughs) non-alcoholic yeasts or uh, we just started doing gluten-free as well so that has introduced some more complexity like when you're looking at something like gluten it's like not only do we have to make sure that the yeast is pure like not contaminated but we also have to make sure that it doesn't have gluten in it right so um, you know, that, that requires some, you know, enhanced cleaning and, and, and quality checks and stuff like that. Wow. Uh, Shane asked the question, uh, what would your go-to dry hops be for a NEPA fermented with foggy London? Uh, is there a specific dry hop schedule that you would be, that would be ideal for that particular strain? Um, I mean, it's like the cheat code yeast. So I guess the cheat code hops, you know, your, your Citra, your, your mosaic, your galaxy, you know, all that good stuff. <laughs> I like Simcoe too, Simcoe maybe. Um, I don't know. Uh, there, there's lots of options there. Uh, what I do think with dry hopping is I, I think a lot of people dry hop too early. Like, I don't think you really need to necessarily do the mid ferment thing. And I think in some cases you, you end up blowing off some aroma. So, you know, I'm a big fan of dry hopping, like maybe a little bit above final gravity. Like if it's going to go down to, you know, 10, 10, 12, maybe I'll dry hop at 10, 16 kind of thing. Interesting. Yeah. There's different, I mean, I've been stuck dry hopping at like day two, right. For the biotrans and then just dropping in after fermentation's done, but yeah, the, the double's yeah. good too. Yeah. 
Um, Guillaume asked a question. Speaking of Koji, any chance we can get some sake specific yeast slash spore blends? Yeah, working on it, working on it. <laughs> oh. uh, we did make a sake in house here. Um, actually, maybe maybe we can get Jonah on at some point to uh, talk to you guys about about how to make sake because it's it's a crazy process. It is it is the most work of any fermentation I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> which yeah, it's very Japanese. It's it's just it's so much work. Every step has to be perfect. It's it's crazy. Um, but yeah, that, that's something that, that we're working, like we're working on Koji, we're working on, we do, we do yeast. Um, so I think that that's something that we could offer in the future would be, you know, a, a, a yeast and Koji combo for, for sakes. Um, and yeah, like the, the sake that we made in house is really tasty, you know, and we grew the Koji and the yeast ourselves. So, you know, that's, there's definitely some potential there. Interesting. And it'd be really neat. To, uh, it's too bad Marcelo's not on because, like, I know. I was just going to say Marcelo <laughs> left. What happened? Yeah, you know, he would. This would have been right up his alley, right? So, um, but that's that's good to hear. Uh, let's see. I don't know if it's. Uh... Oh, uh, Daryl had one other uh, question. If I am heat sanitizing equipment, is there a general temperature that will cause thermo death to contaminants? Thermo death. It's temperature and time. When you're talking about killing microbes or killing anything, it's always temperature and time, right? Um, pasteurization is a, is a temperature and time relationship. It's not just temperature. So uh, you can't talk about just temperature without talking about time. Um, <laughs> it also depends on the organisms as well, right? Um, so you know, I hate that that's my answer, but it, it is a little bit complicated. What I would say is that for, so you have sanitizing here, not sterilizing, so you don't have to kill everything. I would say that um, like if most things get a hot soak for half an hour, most things will be dead. That doesn't mean that all things will be dead, you know, so mm -hmm. to speak. Sterilizing, like true sterilizing is 121 Celsius for 15 minutes at least. Um, like that's what an autoclave accomplishes. Um, so like that's the difference between sterilization and sanit sanitization. Um, in general with beer, we don't have a whole lot to worry about. So if you're heat sanitizing something that can be heat sanitized, like, I don't know, I, I, I like, I like just hot and fast as an approach. Like if you can get something up to 80, 85 C it'll, most things will probably be dead in a minute or two. Again, not everything, right. Um, you can, in some certain cases run into like spore forming bacteria that can resist boiling that can grow in wort and stuff like that, for example. So like that, that can happen. Um, like at one point in our past, we did have like a spore forming bacteria um, <laughs> growing in, growing in, in, in one of the propagation systems that we had to deal with because you know, then it's like, oh, this thing's actually going to survive the boiling. That's, that's, that's no bueno. <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I was unaware of that. I mean, I, I've stayed away from because I know people can do it a lot better than I can. The, uh, the brewing any sort of Belgian style of beer, but mainly because I, I also worry about the diastaticus. But um, uh, knowing that there is least, uh, I, I was unaware that the saison strain that you mentioned earlier, Richard, was you know sort of non diastatic style saison style strain. Like I mean, I'd be like, okay, well then maybe I will try going back that route, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the Ardennes, um, which is like just an awesome Belgian strain, like that one works pretty well for those those kinds of things too. Nice, nice. Uh, I don't know. Does anybody have any other questions for Richard? I mean, it's still. I want to say it's early. It's like it's five after nine, but uh, I'm not sure if there was any other other uh, questions coming in, or anybody had anything uh, that, who's still online. Oh, I can go all night. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here you, go, here you go, Eric, go ahead. I was trying to type up a question, but maybe I'll just fudge it and try to say it verbally. Um, but I was going to ask, what's a product that maybe is out there now or has come and gone that maybe you didn't get quite like the excitement in the market that you were hoping for that maybe like we weren't paying close enough attention to we missed or something. And we're like, how come these guys didn't love this? I love it. That kind I mean, of thing. I mean, ultimately, you know, success or failure of products is our fault, but um, <laughs> Yeah, I have one. Sterling, Sterling Ale. Um, that is an awesome, awesome yeast. It is one of our best performing yeasts. That even includes Kvike. Um, at certain temperatures, it outperforms Kvike. 
like at the colder temperatures. Um, it is a Scottish origin yeast, which I think immediately turns people away because they think it can only be used for, you know, weird malty Scottish beers, but it's like absolutely not true. I would use that yeast anywhere I would use Cali or USO5. Um, and it ferments faster than them and has very similar attenuations. So that is a really great yeast that is criminally underrated. Um, I, I think it's really good, but that's yeah, what, I think it, you know, as I soon wanted. as people hear Scottish, they're like, oh, I don't care. That, that, that's I net there. And now I need to go and try that. I don't think I've tried it yet. Yeah. <laughs> I, bought it, I bought, I was trying to pick which yeast I wanted to use in my porter and I picked English too. And maybe I should have picked Sterling now that you're, you said that. <laughs> you could, you could certainly try it. It's like, yeah, it, it's such a good, like, multi purpose yeast. Um, we will get more people to try it. That sounds, <laughs> that, that actually intrigues me now because um, uh, going back to the Imperial Stout and that type of stuff, I was, I was thinking I'm, I'm stuck with Cali. Um, but if this strain will do similar things, then, you know, maybe, it, maybe it is worth a try, right? And I remember getting uh, Keith Kane's at, given me a small sample uh, from an overbuild that I think that he did. And I never bothered to use it because I was like, I don't know enough about this. Right. But in hearing that and now hearing sort of endorsement that, yeah, no, this is a, it, it can do the same thing. Just uh, it's just a different strain. Right. I mean, I'd be willing to try it. Yeah, for sure. Well, you got 33 people intrigued. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Uh, there are a couple of other questions coming in. Uh, Daryl's asking again, like uh, fav st favorite strain in a triple? Dry Belgian. Dry Belgian is going to be my choice. I really like that one in triples. It is diastatic, but I think I, I like triples when they're dry. So I think it works really well. And he also asked, have you considered releasing Canadian Belgian <laughs> yeast from that famous Quebec brewer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we have it, but I, I haven't had a whole lot of people ask for it. So, there, I mean, we could. <laughs> we could. I don't know. There are some other, uh, in addition to that, like there are, there, there's a couple other Belgian strains that we've trialed that, that have done really well. So, you know, you might see some rejigging of that lineup at some point. You know, that, that, that's something that we're, we're you know, pretty, <laughs> pretty aggressive about is like, if there's a strain that we know that can do a certain job better then you know, we'll, we'll deprioritize the existing one and, and launch a new one. Um, you know, you've probably seen that happen most aggressively with our loggers where like, I don't think any of the original logger lineup is still there or standing. We, we found better strains, um, you know, the original logger lineup from like 2016 anyway. Um, so, you know, that, that is something that we will do is test out strains. And if we like it better, then, then we'll, we'll phase out the, the incumbent. Munich oh, okay. logger, no. Yeah, Munich, <laughs> Munich gone. It's kind of like a battle uh, royal, right? It's Copenhagen, fun. one brewer uses it. And they do a really good job, but it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess adding on to my question about what's a product that has been underrated, I guess... Focusing on the Kvikering series, what's a, a strain from, from that series that didn't get the fanfare that you had hoped and wanted to see? I think the most polarizing one was Halver's Guard. Um, that one was also a while ago now. Um, maybe in the tail end of 2019 or sort of 2020. Uh, but like that's a really cool one because it's phenolic. It's kvike, but it's got it's it's POF positive. It's phenolic, so it's kind of an interesting combination because most of them aren't. Um, so there's some cool things that could be done with it. You could make like really nice kind of Belgian -y beers with it, um, but it you know still had some of those unique esters that kvike has. So I thought that one was interesting, but it was very polarizing. Like some people just didn't like it. Uh, I think because of the, the phenolic nature, less people picked it up. Um, but I thought it was really cool. We're probably gonna bring it back at some point. Um, Luke says Marina was great in a similar kind of vein. Yeah, Marina's awesome too. Um, it, kind of similar situation. The, the phenolic ones have been a harder sell just because there's less beer styles you can use them in. 
Um, but yeah, Marina's really cool. That one's got a really nice kind of I love that uh, like one. I white used wine it, I've kind used, of situation. Yeah, white wine. Totally white wine. I've used it like about five times now. I love it. Mm -hmm. So I guess still on the Kavike train, um, I, I know that you, I mean, in the past when, when Lars was visiting, you're like, everyone just wants to brew an IPA with their Kavike. So well, not doing that. Loggers. <laughs> So now, now, okay, now just everyone wants to brew a clean, high fermented, high temperature fermented lager. So like focusing in on like, what, what would, what should someone brew with, with Kvike that isn't one of those like two really popular things and they want to just brew something that represents the, the, the yeast. I guess it depends on the, on the, str on the strain. So maybe pick a strain. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I think it's it's worth like it's definitely worth exploring the traditional styles, although like I'll be the first to admit that they're not for everyone and that you kind of lose some of the context if, for these like multi low carbonation beers uh, full of juniper. If, if you're not in Norway, uh, it, it's it's a bit of a harder sell, but they are you, they are raw. <laughs> it's sometimes raw. Yeah, like in the right context, they're they're really, really delicious and really special. Um, that being said, like sort of on that vein, I think a lot of the Kvikes actually do really well in English styles. Um, you know, those, as I said, those, those beers that are on the malty side, on the lower carbonation side, um, you know, things like ESBs and, uh, and, and like bitters and milds and stuff like that. Like, I think a lot of the Kvikes can do really well in that context. Um, especially Voss where it's, you know, relatively, focused in, you know, you have some citrus, you have some other esters. It's not too crazy. Otherwise, I think it, those kind of that, like Voss especially works really well in, in English styles. Oh, there we go. Like mild and barley wine. I, I see we have some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it'll do both. Yeah. Who said that... it had to be low ABV, David? Well, mild. I look at mild as low ABV. Oh, oh yeah. You can ABV, go stronger right? too. Yeah. Barley right. wine. Sounds good. <laughs> That would be interesting, actually, because like I mean, the um, some of the Quebec uh, beers I've had, they had it had sort of like to me, it had a bit of an aftertaste to it. But I don't know whether that was, I don't know whether the, I, I assumed it was from the yeast, right? But I, I could be wrong, right? I'm not, I'm not a BJCP judge, and I, I certainly didn't didn't know. But um, but I could see the taste that I remember being appropriate for those british styles right so um wow a barley wine holy cow i don't know about that I just, but yeah definitely a mild i think I, I think i could get behind right uh any other questions for for richard i mean it's uh it's nice. Yeah, it's just one, one, one quick thing about the uh, marina, the, the the Russian. You you called that one. I think it was. I don't know if it's you, but it was on your website. Uh, it's not really a kvike. No, I mean that <laughs> with the so kvike ring. Explain being... what makes it a kvike versus <laughs> that one, because yeah. that that thing fermented in like two days. Like it was, <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you guys have another hour to, to talk about the semantics of, you know, farmhouse yeast versus quike, but I can I can definitely cover the basics. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the quike ring program was originally started, you know, with the intention of sharing quikes, but um, as it as it ran on, we sort of recognized like, oh, this, this is going to start to be a challenge. And, and, you know, especially if we're you know, releasing six months of strains from Hornendal, they may all start to taste the same. Um, so we also had a collection of farmhouse yeasts like that, that are managed in, in a traditional way, similar to Kvike from other places in Europe, right? Because it's, it's not just in Norway where there's farmhouse brewing happening. It survived in some other places. It, it died most places, but it, it did survive in the Baltics and in Russia. And, and Lars has also gone out and collected yeasts and, you know, stories and photos from some of these other places. So, you know, that's where Marina comes in, for example, is, you know, that's a, that's a traditional yeast from Russia um, that, you know, as far as they, they could tell had been used in that family for a long time, um, you know, for generations. Um, 
and you know that's true for some of the yeasts that they found it that he's found in in like lithuania and in latvia as well so you know it's not just norway and you know, as time goes on with the Kvike Ring program, and I know that that makes it confusing because it's the Kvike Ring, but really the intention is sharing these traditional farmhouse yeasts because they have completely unique properties. Like, like, like Marina, you said it, it has, you know, a pretty unique flavor profile and ferments quite fast. Um, so there, there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, and then, yeah, there's so many others that we haven't even explored. Like we, I think we did one Lithuanian one, but there's there's, there's actually a bunch. So, you know, we'll get into that at some point as well. And some of them aren't even like sex or vicier. There are other species. So there's some cool stuff. Cool. Thanks. Well, these yeast, uh, Richard, like, I mean, I, I, I haven't experienced it myself, but I know that other brewers have over time in propagating the yeast. Uh, eventually the yeast changes mutation, whatever the case is. Right. And, uh, it's not doing the same thing that it used to do in, in the previous uh, batches of beer. So uh, say, for example, beers are dropping clear when they shouldn't be clear or vice versa or something like that, right? Um, is, does this happen with these wilder strains as well? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, evolution is never stopping. You know, life is yeah. always finding a way. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's true for pretty much any yeast. Um, there's a, there's a study that, um, it still exists as a, as a preprint. It hasn't been published in the journal yet, but, um, we played a minor role in that, but this, this, this team in Washington basically measured the evolution of the Cali ale strain or, you know, 001 USO5, um, over generations. And, you know, something they found is that even in the span of 10, 15 generations, you have the yeast evolving in the brewery, uh, and, you know, certain traits changing. Um, so I think that that would also be definitely true for the farmhouse yeast as well. In fact, they might even do it a little bit faster, more aggressively because, mm. you know, for example, a lot of them aren't, they're not sterile. They haven't lost the ability to, um, breed so that they have that option open to them in terms of breeding and creating new genetic variation as well. So it, yeah. We haven't measured it, so I'm not going to give a definitive answer, but it might actually happen faster with those yeasts, which was might use, might be why you might see um, sometimes like a little bit less consistent results with some of the farmhouse yeasts. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I just I I just always we always for like I forget because even though I'm home brewing and and you know pitching the yeast etc. I sometimes forget that this is a living organism right and that there's it wants to survive just as much as i would want to survive right so um rob had asked a question i don't hear much about ebergarten uh it was the first kvike i tried and had a lot of great success uh, uh great session ipa brews with it so yeah. he's curious about what's going on well let me tell you we did a uh we did a a, a little sensory study this summer uh we took i think 10 or 12 different like strains and um fermented them all in the same base wort and you know had our staff taste them blind and uh Ebergarden was the staff favorite that was that was the yeast strain that everyone liked the most um so uh you're going to be hearing i think more about Ebergarden as time as time goes on because i think it it really does prove itself as a winner it's it's uh, especially in hoppy beers um it's it's one of the best yeasts in our collection for the the, the thiol biotransformation so releasing some of those tropical flavors um it really does a good job with that and uh you know we are seeing um on the commercial side a lot more brewers picking it up for uh, hazy ipas um and i think it does a really good job of that and um it's one of the strains that we're looking to as a platform for breeding as well to, to try to get some new uh, completely new yeasts um, onto the market. Nice. Um, Alan Hill had the question saying, what are your top five strains available to home brewers? Yeah, I mean, that's always changing. I guess I got to like pick a, <laughs> a broad range, right? Um, okay, okay, okay. Lacto 2.0, I think is, is, you know, we haven't even talked about Lacto, but that's, that's just a really awesome product. I really love the, the kind of tropical flavors that you get with that. Um, so that's one, um, I just said it, Evergarden, um, 
one of my favorite kvikes. I think it's especially for hoppy things. It works really well. Um, Mothership Brett blend. Um, I just love funky beers. I love Brett. I think that that blend is, is always just a really good representation of what Escarpment Labs is all about. Um, so <laughs> that one's really important. Um, I'm going to take a selfish pick for Beer Garden Lager. That's still currently my favorite lager strain of ours. Um, it's just a really classic strain. Um, it has a nice, um, you know, subtle sulfur profile. You know, some of the lager yeast can almost be too clean. Um, I really like what it does in beers. And then, uh, oh, what's number five going to be? I think I'll go with Hydra because I haven't had a bad beer made with Hydra yet. And I think people have tried um, and it's still turned out pretty good. So I think that's a really awesome beer, like kind of also a cheat code for those hoppy beers because it, you know, it finishes a little bit higher. So um, astringency and hop burn is less of an issue. I guess I didn't to really do anything. What happened to Sterling? There, but... <laughs> yeah, Sterling also. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but you said in homebrew, and it's you know it's rarely in. Well, it's it's not always in homebrew format because there's not much demand. Uh, I'm talking about stuff that's always available, but fair enough. I mean, I could I could keep going on. I didn't even get to any Belgian strains here. Well, give us give us a Belgian strain. <laughs> um, well, I think general purpose the Ardennes is is just just so good. It's also one of the only ones that flocks. So kind of makes it a little bit easier to handle um, and not have, you know, yeasty beer. Um, oh, Luke, Luke had another question. What do you think is the hardest, most temperamental yeast to use without being just generally a not great yeast? <laughs> St. Lucifer, uh, period. Oh, really? Uh, that is a, that is an extremely temperamental yeast. It, it loves to stall um and take forever to ferment um but it's also one of our most flavorful strains it's awesome at biotransformation it, it, it's one of the strongest ester producers uh it's an extremely flavorful yeast but you know it makes it it, it makes you pay for it uh, that's another one that you know we're we're using you know we're looking at heavily as a, as a platform for breeding because we like its flavor but we we don't like its performance. Hmm. Uh, Rob had another question saying, uh, there's a great local brewery that runs Ringwood. <laughs> oh, Granite. Yeah, yeah, I know. I wonder, wonder who that is. Uh, is that a strain that might be available in liquid form? I thought, I thought Ringwood was sort of very cloistered. Like, you know, it's only if you're not in the club, you don't get Ringwood, right? So yeah, we like we've off and on we've had a Ringwood, but it's it's not really the real thing. It's one strain. Um, we have yeah, it's something that if there's demand, we'll do it. Um, like certainly, like we do have access to the like three strain Ringwood culture. We can do it. It's kind of just like the you know the the Quike blends that are multi strain. Like it's it's doable. We just Again, because the Ringwood Club loves repitching, you know, I know, I know Granite has gone like a thousand generations. There, there's not a lot of market for it. Uh, Daryl had a question saying, how many times would you repitch a yeast blend? Speaking of repitching. Uh, and he said, overgrown on a starter and stored. Until it stops doing what you want it to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's effectively what the proberers do, so or until it starts changing. Um, yeah. I don't know, in general, like playing it safe, you're maybe four to six gen standard, you know, you can go longer and then, you know, some people are crazy and go more than 15. Is that a, re so is that a repitch Richard or is, um, or are we talking a, an overbuild? So for example. Um, yeah. If you're like growing a starter and like, you're still like kind of, going batch to batch, mm -hmm. you're still, you know, effectively repitching the starter as well. Right. If I understand that correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so it's still, it's still generations. Like we don't, Correct. we don't propagate, um, you know, we don't, we don't take old slurry and, you know, repropagate it like 
and pretend that it's new. There's right? a couple yeah. cases where we'll go like with certain strains where we know it works, where we'll do it out like once, but you know, by in general, we don't, we don't, we don't do that because it is a way to introduce some variability. Uh, I don't know. Was there any other questions or Eric, you said you could go all night. I mean, <laughs> it's almost nine 30 now. Right. So I think I, so far I, I've been like, uh, Oh, yeah, there. Daryl's asking again. Fave thing to use Arden for then, if you if you like Arden. Uh, Arden, like any clean Belgian. Like I'm a real fan of like the kind of hoppier Belgian beers, like uh, Terrace Bulba and XX Bitter and stuff like that. And I think, I mean, uh, there, there's other yeast that are that you know that, that can fit into that too. But I think it works really well for those kinds of beers. Those like kind of cleaner, bitter. Belgian pale ale kind of situations. I really like those kinds of beers. Um, so I would use it for that. Like a, you know, 5% Belgian pale ale with a lot of hops. Nice. Guillaume's asking for sabering tips. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you need, you need a, a heft is more important than, than anything else. You need, you need a, you know, an object with some weight. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that I, we had a little bit of a sabering party with Shortfinger when we released a collab a few months ago. Um, and, you know, I got the short end of the shift there. I, I just had a, um, what was it? It was like a little like ladle kind of thing. Um, so that's hard, but like, you need a, you need like a blunt object, like the bigger and blunter, the better. <laughs> um, and then the other important piece is the follow through, right? You, you, it's just like, like anything. Uh, you kind of want it to be a nice smooth motion. You, uh, you know, you want to follow through. You don't want to just like cut it off because that's, that's kind of how you end up with a smashed, you know, bottle and a bunch of broken glass. Um, you know, look where you want it to go and just, you know, follow through uh, nice and smooth down the line. Uh, and usually you'll have some success with sabering. Um, I don't know. Maybe, we, maybe we'll put a little guide on our TikTok or something. I don't know. Maybe that's how Escarpment Labs um, becomes TikTok celebrities. I don't know. <laughs> Out of curiosity, I mean, um, because there's been a lot of um, over the last over the last couple of years, I guess, right? Over the last year and a half or so, um, there's been an explosion of the uh, seltzer, hard seltzers, right? Um, uh, what has sort of? No, I wouldn't say what has stopped uh escarpment but what has what have you guys thought about when you because clearly you're 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 going to look at other yeast producers and, and etc and, and you're going to look at them and say oh well there's a they're, they're producing an, a a seltzer based yeast and, and they are doing something with seltzer as well you know should we and what's kind of said what, what what was your thought process on it in terms of like should we should we not and i'm not a seltzer drinker so i'm just asking the question right so yeah, I mean, seltzer's been an interesting story where, you know, it, it blew up and then now it's kind of fading. <laughs> um, so, like, that's been kind of interesting. And, you know, we could have put more more into it, but, we, you know, we've still been focused on on beer and beer applications. So, you know, our, our perspective with seltzer was, what do we have in our existing lineup that, you know, if people are looking to make a seltzer that they can use, right, rather than trying to come up with something new. So, you know, that was our focus is, you know, we tested a few different strains in seltzer ferments to be able to give some good advice and make some suggestions. And then um, we also tested yeast lightning um, in seltzers. You know, you can use the yeast lightning plus DAP um, to make seltzers because you still need to get some, some of that bulk um, nitrogen from somewhere. Um, and I know that, you know, some other folks have had a lot of success with seltzer specific products, but you know, it does feel really cynical for, you know, uh, companies that are focused on beer, whether they're breweries or yeast labs to be so focused on seltzer. Like it, it doesn't seem very future proof for us. Um, and I want to make sure that everyone's focused on, on beer as much as possible. Um, that, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, no, it's interesting because like, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the times, uh, going back to what you originally said and not to disparage the other yeast labs or yeast producers, but the fact that the focus for escarpment seems to be on 
knowledge and education and, and, and the science of it and ensuring that that there's in, the information's out there for people versus just the sales, right? I, I think that to me says everything. That's just, of course, just my, my opinion, right? But it, it tells me that uh, there's a long-term there's a long-term vision here for escarpment, right? At least that's how I see it, right? Um, uh, Daryl, <laughs> welcome. Daryl had a question. Any recommendations for doing bread starters on a stir plate? Wart, or sorry, I I, I say wart. Wart uh, versus DME, slow speed, nutrients? Mm -hmm. Um. I would prefer wart with Brett. Brett is... Um, really picky with with nutrients and and something we've seen is that it grows better in in fresh wort versus reconstituted wort like DME or LME um, for whatever reason we're still digging into why that is um, but it yeah it responds really well to fresh wort and uh, in terms of speed I would just go with your usual speed and go with your usual nutrients but just know with Brett that you know you're in for a wilder ride and it'll probably take you know three or four times the amount of time that a, that a sack would take. So, you know, you're probably in for three days or so. Okay. Um, Luke's question, he had another one. Uh, do you think uh, uh, the sack strain selection for Brett co-fermentations or secondaries is particularly important? And if so, what properties would you look for in a sack you intend to pair with Brett? <laughs> Wow, uh, this is intense. it. Does it? It does matter. There was some some research done at, at U of Guelph um, by by um, Caroline Tarava, and and I know that her some of her research is on our webinars as well on YouTube, so you can check that out for the for the deets. But uh, that was one of the really cool findings that she had was that you know if you took these these aroma profiles of different beers that were you know secondaried and primaried with different strains of sack and brett you could you could still cluster the data like you could still you know the primary strain still impacted the final flavor profile of of the beer um which which isn't really what we expected we, we almost expected that the brett would just like pave over the the primary yeast's character but it but it didn't like there were some um you know some interactions there the, the interesting thing was it wasn't really necessarily predictable like the combination that, if I recall, the combination that produced some of the nicest results was Cali and, and Brett D, um, which like Cali is a very neutral strain, but for whatever reason, you blend the two of those and you, you actually get something that's that's pretty close to a like a Brett D primary. Um, and, you know, we, we might be leveraging that combination in a, in a product soon as well, um, because Brett D primaries are an absolute nightmare to manage. You know, sometimes they just don't take off. Wow, uh, that's <laughs> when you guys start talking about Brett and stuff like that. It's just a way beyond me. Um, uh, Daryl had another question: Would a blend like Mothership have the same concerns about repitching as repitching a sack-based blend? Yeah, I mean the the ratio will change over time, right? Like the, I mean, fundamentally, the strains that grow faster are going to take over. That's or that can access certain sugars. Are going to take over so yeah it's, it's not going to stay the same but you might get a you know a consistent flavor profile still like i do i do have some experience repitching mothership um you know like a mixed culture that kind of starts at, started as like old world and mothership and kind of kept using that and it stayed relatively consistent so um i think it is possible uh i have one other question um because because of going back to the brew lab uh podcast how are you guys like escarpment finding it with uh with getting your product into the u.s i mean do you guys have i mean because clearly people know about you right but you're based up in guelph and uh and obviously people are probably searching you out for certain things right so is it getting easier is it more difficult is it it's uh yeah like uh, it's been off and on I would say like the U.S. stuff we we had a distributor um and that that arrangement was working really really well but 
Um, you know, he had, he had some, some personal stuff come up and it was just like one guy, he had some personal stuff come up and, and kind of pulled out of that. So, um, you know, we, we've been a, a little while without a, a U.S. distributor right now. So, you know, we're working on addressing that because it is really important. We need to make sure that U.S. brewers also have access to the products, um, especially because they're, you know, they're just so influential. That's, you know, the U.S. is still basically the center of influence for craft beer. Um, and for homebrewing. So, you know, we do need to have a presence and it's not really enough to just have the knowledge available. Like we, we need people to be able to get the products as well, because then otherwise we're just this Canadian yeast lab that's creating a bunch of value for all the American yeast labs that can make their products available. So, you know, that, that's no bueno. So we you know it's important for us to make that stuff accessible to people. And we're still, we're still, work, I would say like, that's still very much a work in progress. Like we have been so focused on Canada for most, most of our existence. And we still are like, we, yes, the U S is a huge market, but you know, Canada is our focus because that's where we are, that that's where it's easiest to ship to. And, you know, that's where the customers that, that, you know, we're best equipped to help are. Um, but you know, it's still, you know, on the other hand, it's, it's silly to ignore the U S because they're so big and so important. So um, you know, we're working on making that situation work better as well. Yeah, true enough. True enough. It's a, it's a, it's a tough call, right? I mean, um, what does, uh, oh, uh, Rob had another question. Where can we best read about your published articles and or collabs with uh, University of Guelph articles? So Yeah, I did just put a roundup up on our blog because I know some of this stuff just drops and then there's there's no <laughs> uh no fanfare <laughs> sometimes we're bad at promoting ourselves with that stuff uh, i'll drop a link in the chat for that um but it's just like a little blog post that i wrote up that just has uh you know a summary of some of the research activities that we've been up to and you know as those things are like some of these are still in the process of being published so as they're published we'll uh you know we'll make some noise as well um, that's one of the cool things I like about science, you know, more recently is that this trend with preprints is you get to give a preview of a paper, you know, before the reviewers have uh, torn it to shreds. Um, and, you know, they tend to change when they're finally accepted and published, but, you know, everyone gets access to the knowledge in, in its raw form, um, you know, six months to a year sooner than they would otherwise. And I think it's a great system for that reason. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say it again, like, I think that the, you know, based on, you know, I know there's the, the other yeast producers are out there, but in terms of always hearing about scientific research and knowledge, it's, I'm always coming back to you guys and, and hearing about it through escarpment versus through anywhere else, right, through any of the other producers. So that's, that's always, to me, that's always good, right? Um, uh, you know, I have a background. I have a background in science. I think most of the people on, on the call probably have a background in science as well, and it, it's it's always kind of nice to hear that. Um, Luke had Luke had a question, which I, I uh, which one would win a duel? One cell of thirty seven eleven or one cell of Voss? Right. So, yeah, I feel like when when people were starting to learn about diastaticus, there were some good memes, you know, that that were coming out around the time, like who would win, you know. All of the all of this yeast slurry, or you know, one diastaticus boy. Uh, <laughs> so, um, hmm. I think the uh, French saison would would have a fighting chance um, as long as it's able to you know scavenge some nutrients and stuff, because uh, the Voss will certainly start growing faster. But that 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 French saison will be able to access more sugars than the Voss can. So. I think over time it would probably win, but it might take a few generations. So I, I had a question, uh, I, 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 surprise. Um, so say say you have all these exciting strains that come out, so, say like you mentioned uh, Berliner Brett uh, or the Berliner Weiss um, blends are coming out again. Um, how can I plan to have, to, to, to brew with that when it comes out so that it doesn't come out and I'm like, oh, I wanna use that. Oh, I'm busy this month. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. Um, yeah, that's probably something you're. I mean, that is something you're you're going to see from us. Um, is a little bit more planning around the special releases. Like it's something that we've heard loud and clear from the the homebrew shops that they they really want to know what we're planning. Um, <laughs> so you know, our intention is to 
is to let more people into the planning process um, as time goes on for that reason, right? You know, it's helpful to know a couple months ahead, oh, you know, escarpment's going to have a Berliner blend, you know, or escarpment's going to have, you know, this is the Kvike ring that's coming up kind of thing. Because cer certain other laboratories have like a, like a seasonal release calendar. I don't know if yeah. you're, I don't know, I, I, I know you guys are ch changing and getting excited about things all the time. So maybe, I don't know if that's necessarily the, the, the thing, but but being able to be like, okay, two months from now, this is what we're planning. And yeah. there'll be some other stuff too, but this is the thing you're excited for. We know, so this is yeah. coming. I think for like limited releases, that makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make sense for like all of the other stuff because, you know, we, we do grow according to demand because like the worst thing is to grow a batch of yeast and no one buys it. Right. And that, that's, that, that's how the vault came to be, I guess. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Having those guaranteed pre-orders and, you know, we can look at things like that too. I know that we have for, you know, so for some cases like, you know, like cream ale blend only exists for homebrew shops and it's kind of a product of, of, of those requests. Mainly just Berliner blend. I want to know when I when, when to plan to use that so that yeah. I, don't, I don't miss it this year. I missed it last plan, year. Plan for January. January is, is, is probably going to be a good time for it. Okay. All right. I will put that in my calendar and look at it. That's <laughs> <laughs> deep, I... deep in the funk season. So we will have lots of stock probably. I don't know if anybody else had any other questions for Richard. Right, like you've spent like a, I was gonna say you spent a, like a long time uh, answering questions and, and, and talking to us. So, uh, you know, first of all, I, I'd like to say on behalf of the of, of the club, like we, we thank you, right? And uh, oh yeah, Daryl Daryl saying he's 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 done with his questions. So uh, no, seriously, I mean, like because um, I think there's enough interest in. Uh, escarpment, but also in, in yeast in general, that we you probably we probably can't get enough, right? And I know no. there's you know there's uh, there's so much, uh, you know whether it's the information on Kvike, whether it's you know I, you know all the uh, uh, Belgian strains, you know to just your standard stuff. I mean, there's there's enough out there, and to hear the type of things that you guys are doing and what you're looking at and what you're considering. It, it it tells me that there's still a lot of growth here, right? I guess something we haven't mentioned so far, and also thank you. Uh, so Riscartment did sponsor the, the bulk buy, the, oh, yeah. the grain buy. Yeah. So every, everyone who opened their gift bag should have a, a little coupon um, for, I think it's November and December's bike ring. Um, so, so, so make sure you guys check that out if, if you haven't. That was through, through, through Dean, right? Through Homebrew Beer Academy? Yeah. yeah. Through Homebrew okay. Beer Academy. Yeah. Cool, cool. That's exciting. And there's things like, like I said, there's things I learned tonight that I didn't realize. Like, for example, premium pills. I can, it'll be done in like five days at 12C. I was like, oh, well, that's okay. Maybe I don't need to do that other one under pressure, right? I can just leave it in a regular fermenter in my fridge, you know? Mm-hmm. And yeah, if you guys want to taste premium pills, I know um, we, we launched that um, with a collab with Sun and Hill around this time last year. Um, they made a beer called Primo and that, that's coming back. I know that's been brewed, so that should be out in the next couple months. So yeah, if you want to try, if you want to try a really tasty commercial example, that's going to be out soon. Wow. Like Sun and Hill, I haven't had a chance to have any of theirs. They used to have uh, a Saison on tap at um oh geez oh my god on king street on peter street on the danforth our hop yes thank you right um and this shows you how old i am i'm losing i'm losing the ability to remember the name of the bar so uh they had this uh particular saison and it was tasty when i had it and i'm not a i'm not a huge saison person but i really like this one and I know they're up in that neck of the woods in Caledon, right? Um, uh, I don't know if pa Patrick is probably long gone, but Patrick, oh, and Patrick's neck of the woods are. Uh, I'm still let's here. be honest. <laughs> it's oh, in Orangeville. Or, yeah, okay. yeah, basically Orangeville, yeah. yeah. That's my home. That's, that's, 
I've crashed a car, dated a girl, and got 103 in a 60 on Heart Lake Road. So I know that road well. <laughs> We've had this conversation before, man. <laughs> <laughs> So it's so I've never I've never been to Sonnen Hill, but I I I remember when I first had that season, I was like, oh, I gotta go to this brewery, and they weren't open yet. So uh, to mm. hear that there's, the, but I've also heard from other friends of mine that the uh, the loggers they're doing up there are really really good, and I assume that Primo is obviously one of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I, there's a reason that I that I've mentioned Sonnen Hill a couple times because I, I think yeah, Callum is one of the best brewers in the province and you know it's, it's definitely worth checking out the beers that come out of there i mean there's 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 lots of awesome breweries but you know it's just especially because a lot of people haven't heard of of them you know it's worth highlighting i had their standard and the and their other 375 mil bottle from i think those are fooder beers those both i out, out of, I, I did a big order and out of the, those two beers i think like blew me away because i wasn't like i had all the 750s and they're all like fancy looking and i tried the other tried these two small bottles and like, whoa, <laughs> mm-hmm. a little spiffy was good too. Oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we'll, we'll brew another one of those this winter at some point as well. Yeah. Daryl did, did make a, a comment here about um, Dean. Uh, he really does promote the escarpment products. I mean, uh, I know that he used to be a, a, a shop that had uh, Imperial as well. And, and he, he, he realized that, it, you know, the freshness from uh, that he had just down the road from Escarpment in Guelph was there and, and people wanted it to. So, uh, yeah, that, that was really awesome to see. You know, that was um, a moment of redemption for us because, you know, I do consider Imperial to be the biggest threat because they do the best job besides us. <laughs> um, you know, in terms of in terms of just yeast quality and freshness, they're they're great. So. Uh, it's really good to see that Dean was, you know, willing to, you know, uh, you know, stand up for 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 the Ontario products. Well, the fact, think, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Eric. I was gonna say I don't think it's a hard sell. I mean, people like, especially in our club, people talk yeah. about it. People talk in terms of escarpment now, which is mm-hmm. like I, when I started mm-hmm. wondering, if you listen to podcasts, you read books, and everyone talked in terms of white labs, like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then that that kind of changed with. Um, Brewlosophy started talking in terms of Imperial, and now our club kind of talks in, in terms of escarpment. And I, I think it's fun how every, everyone has like their preferences like that, but it really shapes like what people's go-to thought when they're building a recipe. Like I don't even go to their other websites now to look for their their <laughs> recipes with those with those yeasts, because <laughs> I know people who who are my friends who brew things with Foggy London instead. That's awesome. Yeah, I need to check out the, the GTA Brews web uh, recipes more often. I think maybe we should add some too as well. We have lots in house. I was gonna, I was gonna ask yeah, if you oh had yeah. a Berliner recipe for the, yes, for the release. Yes. That would be. If awesome. I have it, if I haven't put the Berliner recipe on a, on the blog, then I will because because like I we searched. brewed we brewed a traditional Berliner. There's photos. There's everything. I probably just haven't got around to putting it on the website yet. I I, I, I mean I googled so I don't yeah but I, I don't I think found, it's there. I, I found the video, but it was an hour long, <laughs> which mm, might be mm. tough to find a, a recipe right. out of. I got to put a few recipes up anyway, so I'll put that on my list. Yeah, that would that would be really awesome. I think, um, you know, to Eric's point about people talking about escarpment and that type of stuff, like, uh, you know, once once the uh, once Dean stopped carrying Imperial and realizing also the combination of that plus uh, our, the ability to, to China to uh, align the escarpment strains with the similar strains on the other yeast producers made it a lot easier, at least for myself. I don't know about other people in the, in the club, but for myself, definitely. I thought, okay, so if the recipe calls for you know this, I can use the escarpment strain of this and I'm getting fresher yeast. I'm getting, you know, uh, a healthier pitch in terms of like the number of uh, cells Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. away we go. Right. I haven't been disappointed since I've, I've never been disappointed since using escarpment in general, but what I found was I kind of strayed away uh, maybe in the last two years, but now I'm coming right back because 
I'm realizing that it's it's just I'm getting better results. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so. I'm glad I took the time to update that spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, there's yeah. reasons why we can't make that available to the you know public public but you know we're always happy to help with that kind of that kind of intel yeah we, we have it on the on the website has it has a table press now yeah so, so it's searchable without having yeah. to deal with the overhead as long as it's of from Google you guys yeah, it's from <laughs> us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um i was going to say my, my last holdout has a non-discovered product in my recipe bank was wlp 90 and now i see you have anchorman which anchorman. i haven't tried yet yeah but i i, I do need but that that was my last holdout. I I, I, had, I Munich Lager was my was my my lager yeast, and that's gone. But I switched to Beer Garden, and, mm -hmm. and I haven't looked back from that. It's better. It's yeah. It's better <laughs> in every way. Now I understand. I now I understand the comment of Anchorman. Anchorman is the is that the San Diego? Is that the is that the San Diego super yeast? Anchorman, I don't know. The wait, movie wait. happens in San Diego. I know. Yes, yes. That's what I meant. That's what yeah, I meant. that's a good answer, Eric. That's, that's, that's what I meant. I meant, I meant it's the state, <laughs> state classy San Diego, right? So that's that. I finally got it. So Is there, um, Isn't there a state classy beer? That's Yeah, that's Bellwoods. That's their like low alcohol oh. hoppy thing. But they don't use Anchorman in that. Well, they, they used Hydra most recently. Oh, okay. Oh. So. Hmm. Uh... What was Luke? Luke said? I suspect White Labs unintentional mixed blends might have killed their prominence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, And Milk the Funk might have had something to do with that. <laughs> Becoming, I think it was more than just them. There, oh, there's I, been a I, fair I, amount of scuttlebutt about their um, their English ale yeast being pretty regularly contaminated as well. Yeah, I mean QC is really important, and and transparency is really important, and and owning your mistakes is really important right um and if suppliers don't do that then there might be some problems that is the best answer you could have given me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I imagine it's really tough to have this have a company like that and and you have you, all these people want to talk to you about other companies and you have to be really diplomatic <laughs> yeah we do yeah in, in some cases you know we you know we we have like we have relationships with some of these other companies and, you know, in some cases we even collaborate with them. So, you know, it is important to be diplomatic. I am going to, uh, because it's so late, I'm going to stop the recording because I didn't realize that the recording is still going. Oh, yeah, so I'm going to, was, I'm going to stop the recording. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, my, my apologies. I'm going to stop the recording and then um, we can carry on the conversation. Um, uh, but I guess uh, as a, as a sort of like uh uh, tail end of it uh, again richard thank you so much for taking the time out of your out of your your personal time to, to talk to us and and to sit with us for these last couple hours uh to discuss you know number one to answer our questions but number two just to, to discuss the things that are going on in escarpment uh and i think at least from my perspective based on what i heard I, i'm pretty excited about all the stuff that, you, that, that was uh, that was stated I hope you're making a big batch of sterling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Like, I mean, we've also been, you know, basically supported by GTA Bruce since we started as well. So, you know, I really appreciate the support from your end as well. Cool. Well, we'll, we'll I'm sure we'll hear from, uh, we'll get you over here again soon, right? Um, once all these new things happen, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, there's lots we can talk about. And again, if you want, if you want, uh, you want Jonah to talk Koji and sake, then I know he can do it because he's uh, doing it for True Grist. So oh, okay. uh, <laughs> nice. that one, that one will be an option. Okay, I was, I was gonna say I gotta taste some saison. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Richard. I'm gonna stop the recording.